did. Um, Maria Les can't be here, but um, it's been great uh, working with him on this paper. Um, and I want to uh, I want to begin by saying a few comments about Martin. Use part of my time for that and and link it to the paper. So. Um, I met Martin, I'm not sure exactly the first time. I think it was when I was uh, on sabbatical at University of Cape Town in uh, 1997, 98. And I didn't really know anybody when I came here, really. I'd met Francis Wilson once before, and uh, he suggested I come to a sabbatical in South Africa. And uh, Tina and I thought that was a great idea, so we came. But um, I was immediately like trying to find out like who should I meet in the uh, country who are the interesting uh, economists working on things and Martin's name kept coming up and at some point I made it to Johannesburg and had a great lunch with uh, with Martin and I think with Joan Federica at the same time and learned about things going on at this and was very impressed with uh, with Martin and his work and then kept running into him at conferences and uh, and so on while he was at uh, Vitz and then benefited from his uh, mentorship and teaching by uh, having several of his students come to the University of Michigan to begin uh, uh, a, a string of wonderful uh, connections there. So Taryn came, uh, Vimal, uh, Greg Lewis, uh, from some of his VIT students who came to Michigan. We later got some of his UCT students like uh, Rob Garlick and Susan Godlinson that we're going to hear from. Um, at some point, uh, I don't even know if Martin remembers this, but I, I uh, helped try to recruit him to come to University of Cape Town because I was at a conference and uh, he was being recruited at the time. And I think maybe Murray organized a dinner. And uh, so anyway, I'll take part of the credit for uh, <laughs> that. But I do remember thinking at the time and, and making the case that uh, uh, he really fit at UCT. And I think that uh, that was true. And it's been a great, uh, uh, a, a great thing for for uh, both Martin and UCT, I think that he that he made that move, um, which um, led him to to take over at Data First. I was actually involved a bit in the creation of Data First with Francis uh, through a Mellon Foundation grant, and uh, thought it was fantastic when uh, when Martin took over Data First and showed how you can not just do great things with making data available and making it. Uh, accessible and and uh, and compatible across different uh, waves, but actually dig deep into um, income imputations and weights and try to make sense of of things that we're going to use a lot uh, in this paper um, that I'm going to present. So that's been a a fantastic history, and uh, Dory covered um, uh, very nicely Martin's incredible contributions to data. Uh, in South Africa. Um, so Martin's been a, a great citizen, um, as Danielle also pointed out in many, uh, in many respects, um, uh, she emphasized in South Africa, but I would add uh, internationally, we were honored to have him at Michigan a number of times, uh, gave fantastic uh, seminars. We had this relationship with, uh, with bringing his students to Michigan, which has been a wonderful thing. Uh, and his research has, uh, I've always thought, was uh, uh, fascinating, and, and uh, uh, the word brilliant was used before, and I, I've, I've always felt that way about, uh, about Martin's work. So it's a great privilege and honor to be here to, to recognize Martin's uh, contributions, and I'm so glad uh, that I could make it, and we could uh, share this paper with you, because I, I think it's a good fit. It, um, uh, it tries to use a lot of data, um, all of the data, in the post-apartheid period, uses the palms uh, data and links it links it to other things. Looks at questions of income inequality that uh, overlap a lot with Martin, and I think um, tries to tries to get into the sort of theoretical and analytical details in a way that I think Martin's uh, uh, work has always uh, uh, demonstrated. So, uh, with that, let me jump into the paper. So, uh, as everybody here knows, South Africa has has long had one of the highest levels of income inequality uh, in the world. Uh, education is very important in that, um, and that uh, works its way in two ways. One, education itself is highly unequal, uh, and there's a very strong relationship between schooling and earnings that's actually 
even stronger than we see in many uh, parts of the world. And so that sort of exacerbates this uh, mapping of education inequality and the earnings inequality. So uh, the paper asked the question, why has schooling inequality declined, but earnings inequality uh, has not? So I'll try, I'll try to show you that schooling inequality has declined quite uh, clearly by any, uh, by any measure. Um, the evidence on income inequality is kind of, kind of complicated. We'll hear more from uh, Andrew about that. Uh, but certainly not any kind of clear decline like one might have expected, uh, given the decline in schooling inequality. So talk about that, what's happened to schooling, what's happened to returns to schooling, uh, how those work together, and including some kind of theoretical results about what happens to income inequality when you have changes in schooling in, uh, inequality and when the returns to schooling are changing, but not in the same way across the whole schooling institution. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. Okay, so um, just to jump in with what's happened to schooling, this is the, uh, these are cumulative distributions of schooling of the uh, economically active population age 25 to 60, so there's a lot of curves there. But uh, the, the point here is that if we start at the one label 1995, that's the first one we use in this uh, graph, um, you see the um, uh, basically a curve below that is always an improvement. So this is the percentage of the population with schooling that level or, or less. And so, um, uh, this, this is basically showing first order stochastic dominance um, for everybody who remembers that. And uh, that means that we have unambiguous improvement in the schooling distribution, but measured, say, by any inequality measure. Um, and more generally, the, that sort of any social welfare function would, would evaluate the 2019 distribution, for example, above the 1995. Distribution. So going down here just means there's fewer people that have uh, less than five, for example, or less than eight. Um, to take uh, one particular point here, the proportion with less than grade 12, which we can read off, fell from 73% uh, in 1995 to 54% in 2019. And there's a lot of details here that are um, interesting. You can see there's somewhat less improvement above grade 12, so that there's also improvement there, but uh, huge improvements uh, uh, below that. So I could show you a bunch of measures of inequality of education, like uh, Gini coefficients or Lorentz curves or something. Um, but you should recognize that once we see this first order stochastic dominance, we know that all of those are going to show that inequality in schooling is declining. Um, that's also true. Uh, racial gaps in schooling have declined. Gender gaps have declined as you uh, all probably know, we're just going to focus on kind of the schooling of the whole distribution. So, so that's a good thing. Um, and one might think would lead to some improvements in the earnings distribution, but um, as we'll see, that hasn't, hasn't really happened, as, as you all know. Um, there's another way of looking at the distribution. So this is the percentage with uh, particular levels. Um, so starting at the bottom, we have the percentage of no schooling, uh, the percentage of primary, incomplete secondary, um, matric grade 12, and then tertiary. And you see the improvement here. So the percentage of none going down, the percentage of only primary going down. Percentage with incomplete secondary um, is sort of a complicated thing because people are moving into there from the lower levels and out of there into higher levels. Uh, significant improvements in the percentage with uh, matric and some improvement in the percentage with uh, tertiary. Okay, so a little um, theoretical um, dimension to the paper is to think about how the distribution of schooling translates into earnings inequality. And it's always useful just to begin with the very simple Mensa earnings equation. So this is log earnings, in this case, imagine being just a very simple linear function of years of schooling. And we'll leave aside age or experience here. Just imagine, say, for a very small, narrow age or experience group. Um, if that were true, then the variance of log earnings, which is a standard uh, measure of earnings inequality, um, 
uh, in relation to the mean and so on, um, is just beta squared. The square returns the schooling times variance of schooling plus residual variance. And we get this very simple decomposition into the explained variance and uh, unexplained variance. So we use this as a, as a kind of a jumping off uh, spot um, with these two pieces, kind of the explained piece and the unexplained uh, piece. Um, and I talked a little bit about what happens with that. So here's what those actually look like. So we take the variance of log earnings. Um, that's what it looks like for, this is for um, men and women combined age 25 to 60. Um, you can see from the top line there, if anything, uh, inequality has gone up by that measure. Uh, the red line shows uh, that for the explained piece, that this is the beta squared variance of schooling uh, piece, and that pretty well tracks uh, the overall um, inequality. In other words, the, uh, the trend um, is pretty much um, in the explained component, such as it is, uh, and the gap there would be the, the unexplained component. Okay. More on that to come. Um, just to show two other measures here, this is the uh, generalized entropy, zero measure, the tile, L measure, and the genie, which actually show more of a trend upward. And uh, Andrew will have some more figures on this, and I'm not sure if I completely agree. I should say here, this is a this is a combination of the uh, Holmes data, which is October household survey, then labor force survey, and then splice in the um, the general household survey starting in 2008. Um, maybe you didn't know. Um, and um, and of course, you know, much could be said here, um, referring again to, to, to Martin and Andrew's work at uh, Data First. When you start measuring earnings inequality, you're very sensitive to uh, who's in the sample, what do they do with high income earners, how is high income reported, uh, how much imputation is there, um, are those people even in the sample, and how does that change over time? So um, things that we worry about in any work become very much exaggerated when you start looking at income inequality and different measures are sensitive in different ways because different measures of inequality are uh, sensitive in different ways to income at the top or income at the bottom, et cetera. David, can I, sorry, this is Dory. Can I just ask a quick uh, question of clarification? Are you looking at the self-employed as well or are these only the wage employed? Anybody with earnings. So we don't care. Self-employed. Yeah, so it does include self-employed, yes. Thank you, Dory, good question. Um, Okay, so uh, thinking again of that uh, of that decomposition. So uh, the variance of years of schooling is what drives uh, inequality in that simple decomposition, and that's graphed here uh, in this red line at the bottom. And you can see that that was kind of maybe even increasing around the time apartheid ended. That's very typical of what we see in developing countries, and then began to decline. So. I've done some other work showing that this, this tends to be a U shape. Uh, and, other, and others have pointed this out over the years. Uh, the variance of schooling tends to kind of rise as mean schooling rises and then eventually uh, starts to go down as schooling kind of compresses. Uh, and that has uh, uh, does tend to go down. The mean has been rising. And that green line is the coefficient of variation, the standard deviation divided by the mean. Uh, one way of measuring inequality in schooling. And you can see that that goes down um, uh, quite a lot, maybe not right at the beginning, but eventually. And this, this you tend to find goes down uh, pretty much everywhere in the world as schooling increases. Okay, uh, so back to this um, one more time about this you know, simple way of thinking about um, the variance of log earnings and uh, the variance of schooling. Uh, you get that very simple relationship if beta, the returns of schooling are just constant. Uh, so every year schooling gets you 8% higher earnings. Uh, but in fact, we know that's not uh, the way uh, returns of schooling work. They do vary across the schooling distribution. And they've been changing differently across the schooling distribution. So we want to try to get into that. Um, so here's what the data look like on that. This is 
returns to schooling within the schooling group. So this is the returns to one year of schooling. So um, uh, 0.2 means 20% returns per year which is very high um, within a certain group. So that's for incomplete secondary say. Um, uh, and then we see this big re increase in the returns to um, grade 12 matric and post matric um, already quite high at the beginning of the uh, post department period and rising quite dramatically mm -hmm. and actually declining uh, in the incomplete secondary group, the grades 9 to 11 uh, group. So that means the returns to having 11 rather than 10, 11 compared to 10 years of schooling, um, which were substantial and, and are still not tiny, uh, but they've been going down. Okay? And there's you know, a lot of potential explanations for that. That's where there's been an increase in the percentage of people getting that uh, amount of schooling. It could have some to do with schooling quality. It could, it's something that we kind of see around the world. So it's not necessarily a uniquely South African uh, explanation. That we need. Similarly, the, the increase in returns at the, to high levels of schooling is something we see uh, kind of everywhere in the world. And it matches it. Can you say something about like how why, these numbers are like an order of magnitude larger than they are in developed countries, right? This is per year, and you're giving us numbers like 40% per year as opposed to 8% per year. Yes, uh, that is that is uh, that is the reality in, in South Africa. So you'll see, I'll, I'll show the whole distribution uh, in a moment, but... Um, so these are these are very high. So yeah, typical typical return in the U.S. would be like eight percent per year of schooling. That uh, may be down to six percent, although higher than that at the top now. Um, but yeah, these are these are very high uh, returns to schooling. These, of course, are just simple, um, you know, log differences. They're not. Um, you know, they're not causal. It's, no, no, no so how did you actually estimate this? Is this kind of like in a regression where you're basically giving each year of education a separate dummy and, and you're averaging them, or are you doing this by splines? I mean, like it's, I mean, uh, how, how are you getting? Yes, these are, yeah. You know the answer to that? They're effectively splines, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're just we're doing like um, uh, earnings, log earnings on schooling in single years with with different slopes in the different parts. Pretty pretty sure that's how we do. Yes. Make sure I understand. So, like for the metric line, that's the diff that would tell us if someone with eleven years went for twelve. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So yeah, that right. is just advice. Yeah. Advice. yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's grade twelve versus grade eleven. 11. Yeah, okay. yeah. But, and very hot. Feel free to ignore if you if this distracts too much. But like, why not just do treat education as continuous? Because then what you're recovering with like a straightforward linear regression is an average slope. What like why did you do the dummies and then re-aggregate? Oh, why are we doing this, the slopes within the different? Yeah, parts? like a linear regression. That's the first thing that's in like a. Like for example, for incomplete secondary, you're doing grade six to seven, seven to eight, and then you're averaging those in some way. No, no, no. You're basically you. Yeah, this is like a slope from six, you know, from seven to eleven, sort of across. That is what they're doing, really, essentially. But they're pinning them together, right, with a spline. Exactly. But I mean, what it means is that basically those very high returns at first metric are predicated on all of those much lower returns at the lower levels because you can only get to first metric uh, by having to respond through the, all of those other levels. Right. I mean, it's equivalent to, to just estimating single year returns and averaging them, which is weighted appropriately. But um, this, this would be. You know, effectively weighted by the percentage of each schooling level. Okay, so high returns and and rising at the top, but falling in the middle and the, in the bottom. Okay, so here's a more general way of writing um, uh, a mensa earnings equation with 
dummies for every single year. So uh, SJI, the, the uh, indicates schooling uh, at eighth grade, say, for for a person on it, um, with a beta coefficient for every single year of schooling. Okay, so that's kind of the most general way you could write the relationship between earnings and schooling. Um, you can now get an expression for the variance of log earnings, um, which looks kind of complicated, uh, but turns out if you take the derivative of that with respect to one of these betas, so now, so the question now is, what would happen to the variance of log earnings if you raised the earnings of eighth graders, say? So we're gonna take beta eighth, and we're going to take the derivative of, of variance of log earnings with respect to beta eight. Yeah. Would that make inequality go up or down? Now, in general, if you think about this, um, what would happen if you change the earnings of people at different point in the schooling distribution? Um, if you raise the earnings of people with high levels of schooling, that should make inequality go up. And if you raise the earnings of people with low levels of schooling, that should make inequality uh, go down say people with first grade or second grade, which suggests there must be some point at which uh, you could raise uh, earnings of some level of schooling and it would have no impact at all. There would be some fixed point. And so we're actually interested in that. So you take the derivative of the variance of log earnings with respect to beta, turns out you get a pretty simple answer here, which is very intuitive. Um, so imagine that, uh, that this beta one, as I call the term, uh, represents, uh, it's actually like beta eight. It's the earnings of people with eight years of schooling. Okay. Suppose I raise that a little bit. What would that do to, um, to the variance of log earnings? Uh, well, it would depend on the difference between um, earnings at grade eight and mean log earnings. Mm -hmm. So if this thing, uh, if eighth graders have above mean earnings, above mean log earnings, then this would increase inequality. If they had below, it would uh, decrease inequality. And if they were exactly at the mean, it would have no impact. So that seems pretty intuitive. And the magnitude of that impact is going to be weighted by the proportion of people at grade eight. So you're going to get a bigger impact if there's more people. Okay, so this I don't think anyone's ever um, worked out before, maybe because it isn't actually interesting, but I think it is interesting. Um, and uh, uh, and gives you sort of a dividing line between when would increases in schooling increase inequality, or when would increases in earnings at a given level of schooling increase inequality, when would it decrease inequality? Um, okay, so I'm going to run with that a bit. Um, now, this is related to a question that I actually interesting, and, and there has been a little bit of work on, although less than I would have thought, and given I think it's an interesting question. Uh, what happens if you increase the income of somebody in the income distribution? What does that do to inequality? So if you gave some income to a person at the mean, that would reduce inequality, and that would um, reduce inequality as you start sort of pulling the distribution in. If you gave it to somebody out on either of the extremes, it would increase inequality. And again, there must be some fixed point or probably two fixed points, if that makes sense. Um, at which you could uh, give some income to somebody uh, and not affect um, the uh, measure of inequality. And so for like for the variance of logs, the answer to that turns out to be at one standard deviation uh, from the mean um, in, either, in either side. Now, the, uh, there's, so there's always gonna be an answer to that question. Uh, and it's gonna be different for different measures of inequality because different measures are sensitive to income at different points. Okay, more on that in a second. Um, just one other thing you can do with this is I took the derivative of the branch of log earnings with respect to um, one of the betas, one of the dummy variables on years of schooling. You could also take it with respect to the percentage of people at that uh, point. Although that only makes sense if, you, if you're gonna increase the percentage of grade eight, you've got to decrease it at some other place. Um, so imagine taking some people that are have fourth grade and moving them to the eighth grade. What would that do uh, to inequality? And the answer again is pretty intuitive. Um, it's basically just a matter of are you 
moving people closer to the mean. So is the place you took them from farther from the mean than the place that you moved them to? And that's going to be, we're not going to do too much of that today, but that's also potentially helps understand what's happening uh, to the distribution. So if you if you shift the distribution away from fourth grade and to the ninth grade, um, that's going to generally um, reduce inequality because you're moving them toward the mean. If you take them from the ninth grade and move them to university, it's going to increase inequalities you're moving them away from the mean. Okay, so you can do that as well. Um, and uh, I think, um, yeah, okay, so back to this point with the, where the derivative is with respect to the beta. So we get this, this, uh, this dividing line between when you could increase earnings at a schooling level and increase inequality and when it would uh, reduce inequality. For the variance of log earnings, the answer to that is the level of schooling of corresponding to mean log earnings. Okay, so you've probably never seen that calculated, um, but it's pretty straightforward to do. Uh, and here's the answer. Um, so it's the red dots there is the answer. To that. Now the blue circles to start with that, that's the level of mean schooling. So in 2006, <clears throat> I um, mean, schooling is about nine years. Would the level of schooling corresponding to mean log earnings be higher than the mean or lower than the mean? Well, if you were in that simple Mincer equation where it's just beta times S, uh, they would be the same because the person with mean, uh, the level of schooling with mean earnings would just be the mean level of schooling. If earnings are convex in schooling, as they are in South Africa and in many places, uh, the level of schooling corresponding to mean low earnings will be higher than the mean. But it's also possible for it to be lower than the mean. And in fact, we've looked in Brazil some time ago, it was actually below the mean because the earnings were actually concave in school. So that's how that works. So the reason the red line, which shows this level, so that says to be clear again, that in 2019, about 12, 11.8 years of schooling um, so interpolating between 11 and 12, um, was the level of schooling at which you reach mean log earnings. So that becomes this fixed point uh, at which if you increased earnings above that, it would be inequality increasing. And if you increase them below, that would be inequality reducing. Mm -hmm. Now, the important thing about this is how much it changes over time. So we go back to 1994, that point was nine years. So if you increased earnings at nine years of schooling, just for that group alone, it would have had no impact on inequality. Uh, if you increase them at 10 years, it would have increased inequality. And if you increase them at eight years, it would have reduced inequality. But that changes a lot as we go over time. It ends up being um, above 11 years, say, corresponding to uh, 2003 or so. I've just marked 11 as a, as a uh, point of reference to show that because um, 11 is kind of an interesting grid, there's been a lot of movement from lower levels up to up to that level. Um, if you increased earnings at grade 11 uh, back before 2003, that would have increased earnings inequality. But if you increased earnings at grade 11 now, uh, it would actually decrease um, earnings inequality. Um, now, what's actually happened, we're going to see is that earnings at grade 11 and, and sort of incomplete secondary have actually fallen relative to the mean over time. Mm -hmm. So would that be inequality increasing or decreasing? Well, it depends on uh, where you are here. Mm -hmm. In recent years, reducing inequality earnings at grade 11 actually increases inequality because that's actually below mean log earnings. Okay, I hope that's making sense. Um, now, an interesting point of reference then becomes um, this, where this point is, uh, where you hit uh, mean log earnings, um, and how the earnings distribution compares to that. Now this, I probably should have shown this earlier, this helps look at the uh, returns to uh, returns to schooling. So this is predicted log earnings. 
that is, it's basically just the uh, the mean of uh, of log earnings at every year of schooling, um, and you may have seen this graph done in various ways, um, say compared to people with grade zero schooling. Um, this does something somewhat unusual, which is it uh, takes mean log earnings at every year of schooling uh, and subtracts off the mean log earnings for that year. So what does this say? Um, that in uh, 1994, the uh, mean log earnings was hit at about grade nine, as we saw in that other uh, graph. And this is what the slope of the earnings gradient looked like. Now, the thing that you see here that you're probably familiar with is this increasingly convex returns to schooling. So as we go over time, uh, we're bringing, we're sort of scooping out here and it's becoming, it's almost linear to start in 94, that it's almost log earnings linear in schooling, although it's a bit steeper at the top. But over time, the returns to uh, grades eight, nine, 10, say, go down a lot from this kind of steepness to this. Uh, whereas the uh, returns to grade 12 here get very high. And that 0.6 that we saw before, you can sort of see here, this is great. This is earnings at grade 11, this is earnings at grade 12, this is 0.6 log points roughly. So huge, huge returns there. Um, now, on the other hand, um, earnings at grade 12, while they've gone up a lot compared to grade 11, they've actually fallen relative to the mean, or maybe put another way, the mean has risen relative to them. So uh, this is not looking at, you know, whether earnings have gone up over or down over time, it's just relative uh, to the mean. So grade 12 used to be 0.6 log points above the mean, back in 1994, well, you know, over 60% higher than the mean, it's now right around the mean. So people with grade 12 are now right around the mean. Uh, so that's all gonna be uh, related to what we're doing here. Okay, let me, uh, let me get to this. Does this take any account income frustration? What's that? Does this take any account of income frustration? Income. Tax taxation. taxation. So tax, tax taxation. Taxation. taxation, no, no, no. No, no. That's going to change the nature of the first. Of course, yeah, yeah. No, no. This is this is just gross earnings pre 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 tax. Yeah, um, haven't thought about that. That's a good, good question. Um, okay, just to mention that I've done all this stuff for the uh, I've shown you all this stuff for the uh, variance of logs here. You could actually do all this for other measures of inequality. Um, there's actually a nice analytical answer for the generalized entropy zero measure. Um, I won't go into that. It's it's going to be slightly different um, than the uh, than for the log variance. Um, the answer actually depends on different. In the, in, instead of being, where is it relative to mean log earnings? It's actually just mean earnings. Um, so that's going to typically be higher than mean log earnings. Um, and for other measures, uh, we haven't been able to get analytical answers, but we can just brute force it by doing simulations. And so we do that. Um, won't spend much time on this, but, but what we do here is we just actually go in and give everybody uh, with zero schooling, 1% higher earnings, give everyone with four years of schooling, 1% higher earnings, and then just, what does that do? Um, and the answer is this, um, if it's below zero, then that had the effect of reducing inequality. If it's above zero, it had the effect of increasing inequality. We know there's gonna be a fixed point. We know it's gonna be roughly somewhere around the middle quote of the distribution, but it's gonna depend on the measure of inequality because they're sensitive in uh, different ways. And for example, we see here, this blue line, which is the variance of logs is very sensitive to income at, at the, zero schooling. Well, that's just, a, uh, if you know anything about these inequality measures, the variance of logs is very sensitive to income at the bottom of the distribution, whereas the gene is more sensitive in the middle and, uh, and so on. Okay, so we'll go into all the details here, but the point is you can get an answer for any measure of inequality in this way. Okay, 
So let me jump to these counterfactual simulations with the uh, four minutes that are left. So we're going to say, um, thinking about this, um, thinking about this picture, suppose that this big reduction relative to the mean that happened here in these incomplete secondary years hadn't happened. What if they were still up here? Um, what would that have done to inequality? Uh, and what if this increase here at the top hadn't happened if they'd been pulled back down to where they were? Um, so we can do that um, by just doing a bunch of counterfactual simulations. We're going to use 1997 for various reasons as the uh, baseline. Uh, and we're going to use the variance of predicted log earnings as the inequality measure. So again, think about just you know, taking people and moving them back to their point they were in 97. So for some people, this is increasing their earnings for some levels of schooling, for some it's decreasing. And here's what we get. Um, I see all the animation has disappeared here in the, in the facing of this end of the larger document. Sorry about that. This was going to show you these one at a time, but I'll just talk them through one at a time. Okay, so first focus on the actual. Um, so I showed you that before. That's the actual um, uh, variant of uh, predicted log earnings from this um, regression that has uh, single year schooling dummies and age and age squared no controls for rates of gender. Um, this red line here is a good point of comparison. This is basically the, um, what if you just change the X's and held the betas constant is the way to think about that, sort of a standard um, kind of counterfactual. In other words, what would the change in the schooling distribution alone have done if all the returns to schooling had stayed the same as they were in 1997? And the answer is, uh, earnings inequality would be lower today than it was in 1997 by a fairly significant amount. So uh, it is true that the changes in the schooling distribution have been equalizing in that sense, that if it hadn't been for changes in returns to schooling, um, earnings inequality would be lower in South Africa today than it was uh, at the end of apartheid. Then you can do various uh, changes. So for example, this 7-Eleven line, this green line, is an interesting line that says, take those people with incomplete secondary, they had a big decline in their earnings relative to the mean. What if that hadn't happened? You move them back up to where they were. And the answer is the inequality would be uh, significantly lower than it is now. So that's exactly what we predict. Those are people that end up uh, below that cutoff line. Um, and that's something that we argue you might not have known, like what if you raised earnings of people with grade 11, is that, or what if you lowered their earnings, would that increase or decrease inequality? We predict it would, lowering their earnings would actually increase inequality. They did lower their earnings, so if we hadn't done that, inequality would have been uh, lower. What about grade 12? Interesting, the grade 12, they also had a decline relative to the mean, but that was actually equalizing. So if we hadn't had that, if we put them back up where they were, inequality would be even higher. What about um, university, what we call grade 15, that is everybody with uh, university and higher. Um, they had an increase in their earnings relative to the mean. That was disequalizing. If that hadn't happened, the counterfactual, we hold them back at the 97 level, inequality would be lower. So we can go this through every uh, combination. Uh, if we do all the way from seven to 15, we get something uh, closer to the one to 15. Uh, it's closer to holding everybody uh, constant, but not quite as much. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the experiment that we do, got 10 seconds. Um, so um, I'll just wrap it up. I think I've made all the points that I wanted to make. Um, don't need to reiterate them. So. Schooling, in, earnings inequality would have gone down based on the changes in schooling, but it was offset by these changes in the schooling earnings gradient, and in particular, this decline in earnings of people with intermediate high school uh, relative to the mean. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much, David. So next, 
Um, we have uh, uh, Andrew Cross speaking about majoring learning and equality with South Africa using hustle and the survey and, and uh, administrative tax. Uh, Thanks, everyone. I'm using uh, two sets of household surveys and doing some descriptive, simple work, uh, thinking about earnings and equality uh, in South Africa. I'm using two sets of surveys and I'm using some tax microdata um, to compare to, to the surveys. So as I'm sure many of you have heard me talking about these topics before, um, beating my drum saying the quarterly labor force survey earnings data is not reliable. Nice to see that uh, at least I persuaded Nicola and maybe David that that was true since they swapped over from the LFS and then used the GHS from 2008 onwards. Um, and I'm partly showing that it's unreliable by comparing to some non public QLFS earnings data that I've managed to get in various dribs and drabs over the years from, from South Carolina, directly or sometimes indirectly. Um, I think what's a little bit interesting about the paper is that the tax data that I have extends far down the distribution. Usually when people are comparing tax and survey data, um, it's limited to tax filers or taxpayers. Um, and the South African tax system is such that, um, at least in theory, and I'll show you in practice as well, that any uh, formerly tax registered company needs to issue or has needed to issue in the last 10 years uh, tax certificates for all of its employees. Uh, if they earn more than 2,000 rand a year. So you can do some comparisons quite far down the earnings distribution and check, uh, the, compare um, what you get from household surveys and what you find in your tax data. Okay, um, so Martin is uh, all over this paper in some sense. Uh, he didn't write any of it uh, or do any of the work, but certainly uh, I guess he was on my shoulder as I was writing it. Um, I'm trying to do careful descriptive measurement work, which is what he's been doing for a long time, as you've already heard. I'm worrying about data quality issues. I'm using the Palms code that Martin wrote uh, when he harmonized the earnings data. Uh, and um, I'm adapting this for the general household survey, um, which I use as well. So I'm ex basically extending Martin's work, uh, two papers published in the South African Journal of Economics in 2017, and doing some work, Martin also did some work comparing tax data and survey data. And I guess I'm uh, extending that a little bit using a different source of survey data and doing it uh, with, with more years. Okay, so just sometimes South African economists get a bad rap. We spend too much time worrying about data and not enough time doing a real analysis. Uh, let's just say that these challenges are also uh, also focused on by people in rich countries. So there's a lot of debates in the US about the current population survey, uh, how imputation response rates and things like that matter for measuring uh, inequality trends. And it connects to debates about using tax data or other forms of administrative data to be able to compare uh, surveys and admin data and shed some light sometimes on the quality of of surveys, although um, having played around with the tax data now for eight or so years at various points makes you realize that there's lots of problems. Uh, perhaps as Martin would say, lots of uh, bodies buried there in the tax data as well, and I'll talk about some of those. Okay, um, so what did Martin's work show? Uh, he was talking about wages, so that's hourly uh, earnings or earnings controlling power of work for employees. Um, Wage inequality was extremely high, uh, roughly stable since the early 2000s, using Gini or variants of uh, log wages that should be not earned. Um, but hiding a more complicated pattern at the bottom of the distribution and caught up to the middle, but the top had moved away from the middle. So overall, some of these measures are showing constant trend, but different things going on in the middle, uh, at the bottom and at the top. So, an interesting question, sort of like how good are the surveys, um, is how close um, do the tax and survey dis distributions look and how far down does that go? Are they similar all the way down? So there's a paper for the UK by uh, Stephen Jenkins showing that basically the tax and survey data in the UK are matched very closely up to the 99 percentile. And that's been argued by uh, Ingrid and Exxon and then uh, 
Janina and also Ingrid, um, talking about the 90th percentile, the adult income distribution. So that's including all the adults, even those who don't have any income at all. Um, and I'm focusing just, in, just on earnings, on labor income. And I'm saying that's not true. Um, and that actually they're quite far apart. And partly we need to think carefully about how to use and compare survey and tax data. Okay, so most people are using palms. Uh, that was Martin's brainchild. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's been used a lot. Um, the general household surveys haven't been used at all. That's actually not true now because you could say in the previous presentation that the GHS has been used, um, but let's say it's hardly been used at all. Um, and they have very similar questions about earnings. So you, they should be giving us similar answers as to what's happened to earnings uh, inequality over time. And in fact, in many years, they have over, overlapping sets of clusters. So they're literally going to the same places to do, to do the surveys and talking to different people because they have an interesting master sample where they draw bits from different parts of the clusters. But essentially, these are very, very similar. And they ask almost identical questions about uh, income from employment. And this is before any deductions or transfers. Or anything like that. As I'm saying, just to be clear, this is only about earnings for the employed, and it's not about uh, any other forms of income. And I'm including, at least in the beginning, I'm including the self-employed and wage employees. And then later on, when I use the tax data, I'll just be uh, comparing to um, uh, comparing employees only, and not thinking about self-employed. Okay, so just a brief, I never know what IRP5 stands for, but it's a tax certificate that we all get. Uh, if you're employed, your employer gets you, uh, Ingrid, you can tell us the answer. Yeah, I Googled it and I couldn't find any answer. Okay. IRP5, it's a, it's a thing. It's a tax certificate that you get uh, every year. And everyone who earns more than 2,000 rand per year, so basically it's everyone in the formal sector almost, uh, is supposed to be included. Okay, so that's about 60% of all employment and about 70% of all wage employment. Okay, so here's one of the first things we should worry a lot about. I won't have much to say about unit non-response, but basically that's been around about 90% uh, in the GHS and the QFS. I yeah, don't have anything to say about that, but what is important is that in the LFS, QLFS, and GHS, the non-response rate to earnings questions, item non-response, for people who did answer the survey, they were willing to give other information to, to Stats South Africa, they didn't report their earnings, that's increased from around 7 or 9% in the early 2000s to 29% in the latest uh, GHS and QLFS that I use. So, um, because of this, it becomes really important. You can't just leave those people out. So one of the things that Martin incorporated is 2008 paper try, trying to get the, uh, a good a good method of, of accounting for the people who respond in brackets. So people who say I'm between five and ten thousand rand a month, but don't give an amount, and that works reasonably well when only seven or nine percent of people. Uh, don't give us any information at all. But once we get into the 30% or close to 30% range, ignoring those people uh, is not uh, makes a big difference. And I'm not going to show you that, but it, it does. And so I use Martin's second method, uh, um, a type of hot deck imputation. Uh, and I, I undertake this in the GHS and in uh, the non public QFS that I'm going to show you. I'm not doing multiple imputation, and I'm not going to show you any standard errors. Okay, so this might be confusing. I'm going to show you three sources of data, and I'm calling them GHS, PALMS, and QLFS, public. GHS is the public GHS data. PALMS is PSLSD, OHS, LFS, they're all public, and then non-public data from the QLFS for 2011, 12, 2018 to 2020. I'm stopping at the end of quarter one, 2020, so basically pre COVID. Okay, so even palms, it's not in palms, you can't go and download this now because I don't have permission from Stats to say to share the data, but I'm calling it palms because it's, I'm treating it consistently and applying the same type of method uh, of imputation 
uh, for all of those waves that I have where that's possible. And then I'm calling QLFS public. That's the data you can download uh, from Stats or from Data First. And that is imputed very untransparently by Stats South Africa. And I'm going to show you that there's some pretty severe problems in that data. Okay, so basically I'm showing you two types of things. I'm going to show you the earnings distribution, five different percentiles, uh, and a few different measures of inequality, and that's what you're going to see for the rest of the paper. Thing. Um, so this is the, the 90th and 75th percentiles, uh, and what you can see is that ARMS, which is LFS, publicly available, and then QLFS, non-publicly available, and the GHS, look, Pretty similar, as you'd expect, as I mentioned, they have the same question, they have very similar samples. Um, those look pretty similar. And then what you can see is QLFS public uh, looks quite strange. Uh, there are actually uh, quite large declines in the 75th percentile and a decline in the 90th percentile. Um, so that suggests that there's some potential problems. And you can see that this is true again, exactly the same story. Uh, looking at the media and the 10th and the 25th percentile. Um, ARMS and GHS, well, LFS and GHS look similar, and the non public uh, QLFS and the GHS also look a bit similar. And again, you can see these strange um, declines in uh, in the public QLFS data. Can I start a, a background question? Mm. What is there? Like a big line without it, so presumably there's no data. Yes, it could like 20. Yeah, so that's that's the dribs and drabs that I've got out of Stats South Africa and people who got it from Stats South Africa. I only have that nice non intuitive data for 2011, 2012, 2018, 19, and 20. So between 2012 and 2018. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is, I don't know if people. Are aware of this, um, but this is for the GHS. If Timothy tells a similar story, take the GHS, which started uh, in 2002, and make all of these five percentiles equal to one. And what's happened to, to changes, what's changed for each of those percentiles? And you can see that the biggest increases were at the 10th and 25th percentile, then the 90th, and then the 75th, and then median uh, the increases were much smaller. Um, so, kind of a little bit not so obvious uh, that actually the bottom is then um, the best um, in relative relative terms at least. Um, is this this is real or non? -real? Yeah, yeah, it's real. Yeah, which is also kind of amazing. Um, yeah, and you can see that these are sort of flattening out a little bit in the later period, but certainly there were some big big increases. Um, doesn't really decrease. I mean, uh, the increase is still large for so the labor earnings. Or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Self employed and wage employed altogether. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to show you too many, but this is just an example from quarter one 2020 uh, dividing. Uh, I'm comparing public and non public uh, QLFS data to show you. The, types of problems um, that appear in the data. You can't see this yourself if you go and download it because you just get what Stats South Africa gives you. Um, but let's look at the non-public response. So I'm dividing these people into three types, people who only give brackets, people who say they don't know, and people who refuse. So, and these low percentages, they're something to it. So what this means for people who gave brackets, in the non-public data, I go and look at them in the public data that have the same household ID, same person number, and I've checked a bunch of other characteristics. These are definitely the same people. And then ask what proportion of people uh, received an imputed income amount from Stats South Africa that was inside the bracket that they reported. Okay, and so that number is 10%. Okay, so another 61% were imputed a number outside the bracket they, they reported. Mm -hmm. And this is perhaps even more strange. In the public data, 28% of people who gave a bracket are reported as a refusal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you go to the... They're imputed as a refusal. 
Well, they're limited in the data as refused. Did I say the wrong thing? No, 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 you said the right thing. But I mean, at least I can't believe it. But that must be an imputation because it didn't actually. Right, excuse me. Okay, yeah. sorry. So, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and then for the zone nodes, 64% um, of them have an amount imputed because they actually don't know. We don't know how good it was. But 36% of them are listed in the data as having refused when they actually said don't know. And for refusals, 40% uh, and 20%. If you, one reason to believe me, which I haven't shown, is if you go and have a look at the earners, uh, the people who gave earnings amounts, those are almost identical. If I do my method, you take the value, they say monthly uh, 5,000 Rand. I say that they have 5,000 Rand. You go look at the public data, they have 5,000 Rand. So they match perfectly when it comes to the people who gave actual amounts, obviously, and then you have to convert. So someone says weekly, you should multiply that by 4.3 to get a monthly amount, which you then see in the public. So these definitely are the same people in the sense that for the 50% of the employee to actually give a RAND value, uh, I get almost the same results as Stats South Africa. They didn't do any imputing or changing. Uh, it's these three categories where all of the problems are. Uh, cut some slides, but yeah, it's about 50% by the end of the period, 50% give an amount, 20% give a bracket, and 30% say either refuse or don't know. And most of the diagnosis of proxy respondents answering on behalf of another household member. Okay, so if we take uh, our two sources of data, so this is I'm calling this palms, this is now the not public data um, in this period over here uh, in the PSLSD, OHS, and other it's, it's what's in the public data, what's in palms. And what you can see is the pattern that I've mentioned, Martin uh, showed us that basically over the entire period is an increase uh, in the 90-50 ratio. So the top has been moving away from the middle. Uh, and you can see that both in palms, the blue and the GHS. And then at the bottom, the same uh, pattern that Martin has uh, identified up to 2011 uh, is that there's been a decline um, there's some perhaps strange things going on, on in, the, in the GHS, but generally speaking, uh, the, the bottom of the distribution has moved towards the first. Okay, um, for fun, I've now included the QLFS public data, um, and you can read World Bank and other reports. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that if there's a World Bank representative, but anyway, you didn't write it, so that's fine. Uh, let's take this point over here, and let's take this point over here, and we can say that South African earnings and equality has increased. You can find this uh, analysis, and that's wrong. I can't tell you why, because I don't know what this statute A imputation algorithm is, is doing, uh, but I can tell you that this is, is probably wrong, and if you take uh, OHS, LFS, and the QLFS, the red, uh, or you take the GHS, okay, there's one or two strange things in the GHS, but in general, uh, I wouldn't say that there's a huge increase in the Gini, maybe from the early 90s, but again, maybe we weren't capturing the more marginal forms of, of employment. That, so at least from when the surveys get more comparable in the early 2000s, there hasn't been a huge increase in the Gini coefficient. Uh, and actually in the variance of log earnings, it's possible that even uh, declined a little bit. Uh, I guess we need to compare notes as to what exactly we uh, each did with all of the uh, different bits of data and how we treated them. Okay, so uh, yeah, inequality hasn't increased nearly as much as you would think if you took the QFS data uh, from, from stats and say, or I should say, I mean, this is a little bit embarrassing, or in part. Uh, because that's what's in palms at least up until 2017. And since 2017, at least Martin and I have been warning people uh, you should be careful about using the earnings data in QLFS. And since 2013, we've been asking Stat South Africa to release uh, earnings data that's not imputed and publicly, and uh, that hasn't happened. So that's a bit, that's a disappointment. In fact, uh, if you try and the 2021 labor market dynamics doesn't have any earnings at all. Uh, so that's disappointing. I guess uh, we just decided to stop sharing uh, sharing earnings data. So if you want earnings data, you have to go, go to the GHS. 
Okay. Um, just do some comparisons between text and survey data. What we want is the same hypothetical group of people because the tax data only has people in tax registered firms. And we can do that fairly well in the QLFS. Um, but in the GHS, we can't. This is the question of are you wage or self employed? So we can limit to wage employed. But uh, they just ask, is your employer in the formal sector? And it turns out that that group is quite a lot larger than the group of tax uh, of people issued the tax certificates. But the QLFS is, is quite similar. Uh, and I'll show you that in a bit. But another thing that I think is I'll show you is important is that the tax data includes everyone employed at any point in the tax year and the QLFS and the GHS ask about employment in the reference period so that's usually a week um, and so what you end up with in the tax data if you use all the tax certificates for one year you end up with a group of people many of whom were only employed for a short period of time and those people have earnings on average that's lower than people who are employed um, for longer periods of time. So basically, there's a lot of, I'm sure this before in other work, there's a lot of worker movement in and out of employment, reasonable amount in South Africa, and that's much higher at the bottom end of the earnings distribution. So I'll show you that that's important now. Okay, so just this is the number of earners in the different groups. As I said, at least in the end period, palms, when we limit to people who have a formal contract to report that their employers contribute to UIF and are not domestic workers. Um, so for that group, um, the QLFS and the tax data overlaps nicely. There's about nine, nine and a half million, close to 10 million people. And then this is a group of people who are employed in the first two weeks of the tax year. I'm trying to make the, something similar to the QLFS reference period um, that I mentioned um, and, and GHS reference period. So, Assuming that these two groups are similar, you can see that the GHS formal sector is quite a lot higher. So a lot of people who are reporting that their employer is in the formal sector, but nevertheless seem like they're not being issued tax certificates. And then this is the group of people who are employed and appear in the tax data at any point, the red line, uh, appear at any point in the tax year. And you can see that that's very substantially higher. Um, and I'll show you that the distribution for that group is quite a lot lower. Okay, so I'm showing you that right here. This is the P70 and P90. Um, and now the QLFS numbers um, and GHS are different because these are now employees only and then the formal six only. So they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't correspond exactly to the previous uh, figures that, that I showed you. And what you can see is um, here the difference that I was mentioning. If you took the full year, everyone who's employed at any year, uh, sorry, any point in the year in the tax data, that distribution looks much more similar. But what you should really be comparing to is this uh, blue line. That's people who are employed in the equivalent to the QLFS or GHS reference period. So you shouldn't pick a group of people who are employed at any time in the year because they don't, employ, they don't appear in the, in the surveys. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see that tells the surveys, the three surveys have got the public uh, QLFS showing a decline in earnings uh, at the 75th, uh, static at the 90th. Um, the, I don't have enough non-public data to figure out what goes on here, but there is an increase. And then clearly in the tax data, you're seeing uh, quite a lot bigger increases than you do in the surveys. So that's and the overall, you see some of the overall gap that the earnings are so much higher in the, in the tax completed survey data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just people under reporting their earnings in the surveys? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yes. Uh, well, the combination of, and unfortunately, you can't tell this, but a combination of under reporting and then the non responding yeah. people at all, then the weights not doing the job. I mean, NIDS wave five. Uh, top half was what five percent response rate um, of the white and Indian sample or EAs uh, in 2017. Uh, so you can imagine that you know that's the kind of group maybe South South Africa is doing better than this, but um, still you can imagine that the response rates are, are low. And then the question is, do the weights uh, do the work of getting? Back and then the question is, and I can't answer this: How much is the weights not doing their job, and how much is it under-reporting of the of the people who show up in the data? I 
Yeah, I call it steep but but for the GI like different definitions of incomes and earnings that people are reporting. Right. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's exactly uh, in theory, I've lined the data up so that they're identical, but clearly people are, and that's something that Martin showed. Um, well, he showed that the net of various uh, medical insurance, uh, pension contributions, the distribution starts to look more similar when you take those things away uh, and then take tax. So one thing that people have said is what people are actually reporting in the surveys is the amount of money perhaps that shows up in their bank account at the end of the month. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry, just a descriptive question. You mentioned people who are not earning all the year through, so there's sort of periods of work in there. So it's moving in and out of work. Do you know if that has a period or a pattern to it, like seasonality, mm -hmm. or it, does it happen across the year, which means um, informal sector peace right. jobs in and out? Um, so there isn't much of a seasonality pattern that you can see in the affairs, but that's yeah. only the four, that's only four dots during the year. Okay. Um, Thanks. The tax data through the year numbers, which doesn't include the informal sector, but those look strange for reasons that I don't understand. Thank you. Um, yes. Sorry, Andrew, it's Rory. Can I just give a quick comment? I would say that most people don't know what their gross earnings are. I mean, if you just did a random sample, how much income do you earn? You know, what immediately would come to people's minds is what they take home, not you know, the gross package, which includes pension, and if you're lucky, and you're going to get a particular bias then, right, because mm -hmm. where the um, the benefits are higher, then that's going to increase up the scale, and that's not going to be reported. Anyway, right. I just, I've always thought that, that people don't know their gross income, and then mm -hmm. you've got to whatever, you know your gross annual income, and you divide it by 12, that's way too much, you just report what you get in the bank. Uh, I'm trying to think about wh whether we could investigate how how important that explanation is by thinking about <clears throat> what happens to the distribution if you do subtract these things at the bottom where there's basically no subtraction going on and then up at the top. So I, I have to think a bit more about this. Thank you. Um, and I'm showing kind of similar things at various other points in the distribution. This is the median. Um, so interestingly, even in the uh, tax data, you see kind of declines in the last few years in the media, um, and then the QLFS public uh, data is showing very large declines in the media that don't don't show up or are much smaller in the non-public uh, QLFS and uh, the um, And you get something similar and. Uh, in the previous graphs, when I was looking at everyone and all the employed, I put the 10th percentile on the same axis as the 25th and the median. And so it hides actually how dramatic the fall is. So this is now only formal wage uh, earners. But if you believe the imputed data from South Africa, then basically the 10th percentile earnings is halved. Uh, and you can see that that's not true in uh, the QLFS uh, or QLFS. Okay, and if you just uh, do the same thing as I did for the DHS, uh, what's the growth of the different percentiles? Um, and I guess this is kind of interesting. Well, first of all, again, the 10th percentile is doing uh, much better, uh, and the others are perhaps a little bit closer together. Um, but still, this is sort of a puzzle. Anyone wants to give me any contributions? GDP per capita in real terms is constant over this period. So, uh, Everyone benefited uh, over a period in which everyone, uh, everyone in the tax data uh, benefited during a period in which GDP per capita inverted. Okay, um, so this is just a, I've shown you this at different percentiles, but this is to take uh, QFS and RP5 into the tax certificate data uh, and compare the difference between the two across. 10 million people or nine and a half million people. Um, the value of one is 100% more. So uh, RFP5 tax certificate data is 100% more for people right at the very, very top. Um, I've only shown the 90th, 70th, and 50th. So this is just kind of everyone. And this is a metric that comes from one of Martin's papers. 
Um, and you can see that this declines, so the difference between the RP5 uh, and the QLS declines with um, the rank that you are in, in the distribution. And this strange thing over here is just because there are, in this way, about 200,000 more people um, in the tax data than, than there are in the QLFS. And so you're comparing someone at the two, at the very bottom, you're comparing the person reporting five rand in the QLFS and the person 200,000 up from the last earner in the, in the tax data. And so that's uh, going a little bit wonky down at the bottom, but the point is that it's, uh, the difference is very high, um, but, but it is declining um, as you. Uh, the rank is the highest. Oh, yes, sorry, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So the gap was biggest among the rich. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, kind of yeah. like what I thought too. Yeah, yeah that's a good shot. Yeah. Um, we can, how much time do I have left, Uh Eight minutes. We can do the same thing again, have a look at inequality and percentile ratios and I'll show you the Gini and variance of long earnings. Um, if you, this is kind of stock, if you believe the public cure defense data, the um, median is raised away from the bottom uh, and then the tax data and in the GHS and in the cure defense, uh, non-public is precisely the opposite. Um, 90, 50, you kind of get the same broad results, although it's uh, substantially exaggerated in the public. Um, if you have a look at the variance in log earnings, this is again formal employees comparing tax and survey data, you can see that uh, it's very, very dramatic and wrong probably in the public QFS data and in the GHS and uh, the QFS non-public is uh, constant or so hasn't changed very much and it might have even declined in the tax data and the Gini is roughly constant in the tax data um, maybe increased a little bit in the QFS non-public it's much higher in the GHS but this is because you're not comparing exactly like to like um, yeah Okay, so I think that's um, that's it. I think as I say in every presentation when I use survey <laughs> data, uh, we we really do need from Stat South Africa a public release of QLFS uh, that doesn't have these imputations. Um, it's really, it seems like someone is doing the equivalent of pressing do on a do file uh, and that broke. Um, uh, yeah, and so that's that's not good. Um, I think this shows that we need a substitute while we don't have the QLFS. The GHS is an obvious um, example. So uh, Amy and Martin and myself are hopefully going to at some point put a harmonized version of the GHS into the public domain. Um, the tax data are cool. They allow a comparison of quite a long way down the distribution. Um, it's a large share of overall employment. So that's not something that is easily done uh, in lots of other places. So it's cool that we can do that in South Africa. Um, I didn't say this paper was funded by Amy White, even though I wrote it on the slide. So I should acknowledge them as the funder, and they've done a lot of work to get the tax data into, into the public domain well, and uh, at least allow researchers access to it. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Thank you. All right, on time and under budgets. Uh, thank you for the answer. Um, okay, so now we, Andrew finished a little bit early. So we have, now we're going to have uh, like open mic time effectively, uh, even a little bit extra. Um, so uh, we will we will have some contributions from Zoom uh, people. Tara, do you know uh, if. Um. So Susie should be on there, and um, the there's a video garlic the, video. That's right, the garlic productions. <laughs> so there were um, some uh, some people on the U.S. side who could join us, and some who wanted to. But um, right. so Susie's here. Susie's here. So um, why don't why don't we do it go first? Then... Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
Susie, will you be okay to, to speak now? You can unmute yourself. Yes, I can speak now. Hang on. Can you hear me? Uh, I can, just hold on a second. Uh, let sure. me stop sharing my screen. So you, okay, let's close the chat. Um, uh, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, all good? Okay. Very good. Thanks. Um, so I really wish I was rather there in person. I think these things are just so much more effective in person. And I wish um, I was able to celebrate some of the many ways you, Martin, have impacted us as individuals, both as researchers and as educators, um, but also the vast impact your research and policy advising has had on South Africa. For me personally, you have had a profound impact on my life. It is because of this outsized influence that you've played and the respect that I have for you that I continue to be terrified of you. It is also why I know I can never quite find the words to fully express my gratitude. We met at a point in my life when I was grieving and I was quite lost about what came next and even, even frankly, what, what mattered. According to the family plan, I really wasn't supposed to still be studying and, and I really, I needed role models. I needed advice. And I needed advice from someone who had my best interests in mind and could see a path that I couldn't see for myself. I also needed a, shove, a, a nudge, actually a, really a shove into the next chapter. I can confidently say that I would not have gone to graduate school nor be in a job that I absolutely love if it had not been for your influence. Going to grad school was not part of the plan. Even when applying, I really had no idea what I was doing and what I was signing up for. And I certainly did not understand the payoff of being able to be a professor. Beyond the personal impact you've had on my life, I wanted to highlight just two of the many influences you've had that might not be as dominant in some of the presentations, some of the academic presentations today um, and other reflections. So the first is I wanted to share an anecdote of the intergenerational impact um, of you pushing us to think harder and be careful and critical users of data. So at Williams, our Center for Development Economics Master's program includes fellows from government ministries from low and middle income countries. In any typical year, we have about two to three Malawians who have completed their undergrad at, at Chancellor's College. Pretty early in my time here at Williams, I started to notice a pattern. I was able to recognize which students had had the late Dr. Richard Musa as their professor at Chancellor's. And I this became self-evident because of how they thought about data. And that it was very different than their peers. And I could see your influence. In my own classroom with these CDF fellows, I have designed a course around using data where your papers and those of many in the room there today are really at the heart of the class. Your investment in students extends well beyond your own classroom, your advisees, and the borders of South Africa. Second, I believe you embody doing something because it is the right thing to do. It is truly admirable and it sets the bar pretty high for all of us. While this is something we would hope would be the standard in academia, I think we could probably all agree it frustratingly is not. There are so many different ways in which this plays out in the way in which you work, whether it be in research, teaching or advising. Um, it is present in the types of questions that you answer, in the way in which you approach answering those questions, but it is also in the way in which you choose to invest in the students that you invest in. You have greatly contributed to diversifying the profession and you've been doing this long before it became the trendy thing to do. It didn't matter who we were or what our backgrounds were. As long as we were willing to learn and to work, we, were all we all got to benefit from your commitment to teaching and advising. So for me, I just wanna thank you for all you've done for me personally, but also for the generations of others who have benefited and will continue to benefit from your commitment to learning um, and getting the right answer. So thank you. Susie, thank you very much. Um, let's, uh, let's minimize the slides here and let's look for MW conference. And we have um, the video message. Let's hope that's. <clears throat> Hold on. 
Well, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that is that is going to be necessary. Hold on a second. Um, we're Zoom. Nope. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Can those on the can those on the online see we're sharing a, a, a screenshot of this thing? Uh, I hope you all can see it. Um, so uh, let's watch. Martin's courses were some of my first introductions to econometrics. It was sometimes terrifying. It was also an excellent ground. Martin stressed the absolute importance of truly rigorous identification and methods while teaching us how to get there and to use them. I've taken many econometrics courses since then, and I now appreciate how unique this combination was. Martin showed us how to do good economics, the models underlying statistics, the statistical approaches that apply to specific contexts, and how to apply these methods to real data. He was an excellent teacher, clearly explaining very complex ideas in functional ways. The question was never, do we have to do this? Because of course we had to, if we wanted to do solid research. It was instead, how can we do this rigorously? Martin's own work speaks to this. He can squeeze data until it squeaks out the truth. <laughs> this was an invaluable grounding for me. Martin gave me a sense of the fascinating nuts and bolts of data work. I've been carrying his notes from his classes for the last 13 years. They have now moved to three different locations. So, thank you, Mark. You've been a wonderful influence on my understanding of economics, and I feel very lucky that I got to have you as a teacher. I took Martin's core econometrics class as a master's student at UCT. This was my first ever exposure to proof-based econometrics and had a big influence on me in the short run, the medium run, and the long run. In the short run, it hurt. <laughs> this was a very steep learning curve for me and for many others. Some of my classmates protested and rebelled, literally. But Martin persevered. He understood the importance of building this foundation. He made us persevere. And equally importantly, he gave us the support and the teaching that we needed in order to persevere successfully. This combination of very high standards and extensive help in meeting those standards is a trademark of Martin's teaching. It's admirable, and it's something I've tried very hard to emulate, and it has been hard. In the medium run, all that pain paid off. In the first year of my PhD, I often went back to Martin's notes, and econometrics went much more smoothly than my core method. The foundation from UCT helped me appreciate econometrics and got excited about what to do. In the long run, Martin had a more subtle, but a maybe even more important influence. The asides he made in class and the comments he made in seminars had a big influence on how I thought about the interplay between data and econometric methods. I ended up very interested in how we collect data and what that means for how well or poorly different econometric methods are going to work. I spend lots of time talking to my graduate students about how they're going to account for the inevitable measurement error in their data. Lots more time than they want to spend discussing that, but it's important. And I understand it's important thanks to Martin. In hindsight, Martin was the first person who introduced me to those ideas, and I come to view them as deeply important, and I still think that econometrics underemphasizes them hugely. Thank you, Martin, for believing that we could do better, expecting we should do better, and helping us to do better, both as students and as researchers. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. We can see this. Okay. Um, uh, I, I definitely want to give let I want to let Anne uh, Kay speak because she she wants to say something and she came a very long way to say it. <laughs> and then uh, uh, and you know it, and I see Robert and and Lisa and Catherine. So you know if the spirit moves you then. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I will. Okay, so we're going to have Anne first, then I saw I over the stand and then, uh, okay. Is that okay? Then, yes, I'm just going to turn it. Okay. No, 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 I'm just going to turn it so they can see me on Thank oh, you. Yes. Thank you. I um, also would be good if I speak before I keel over. I think that would probably be a better order for things. Um, I want to thank the organizers 
Um, and kudos for all of the papers that I've heard so far, which has been all just terrific work. Um, I first got to know Martin before many of <laughs> you, I think. Um, he was at, at BITS and uh, we began piloting um, a health income survey in Dormkop on the Western end of uh, Soweto in the late 1990s. And we would drive to Dornkop. So Merton Daggett and Angus would be in one car. And I was really lucky because it was Martin and I in another car. And that gave us a lot of time to talk about research questions um, that we thought were important. Mm -hmm. So we talked about income and in income inequality. And we talked about labor markets. And we talked about um, the all important spatial issues. And we talked about uh, the essential need for data. And these are the questions that Martin has dedicated himself to over the last 25 years. So what I didn't know then on those dusty roads into Dornfall was that this would be the beginning of a very long friendship. Um, and this, uh, this Dorn Cup um, time was also the first time I ever really saw Martin in action. So we'd be training a field team. And one of the questions would be to try to make sure the field team understood what we meant by a household member, right? And so Martin actually drew from his own experience of households he knew. And he would say to the field team, but he was testing them to see if they understood, okay, so the household head has a cousin who has a brother-in-law who has a daughter. And then there would be this spectacular web of uh, relationships. And then he, at the end of it, he would turn to the field team and say, so is that person a household member? And the field team, which really wanted to get the right answer would look at us. And most of us were looking at each other. <laughs> I was like, oh, I really lost the page when the daughter of the brother-in-law of the cousin of the household had got divorced and what happened to the kids. So, but for me, what that really also demonstrated was that Martin really cared about getting the answer right. Um, he, um, uh, we all know very smart people and we all know very clever people. Um, but for many of them, their work stands only to show how smart and clever they are. So we all know Martin is a very smart person and a very clever person, but um, his work has always been in the service of trying to get a, a better understanding about what's really going on. And that is a, a, an incredibly unusual researcher. Um, Martin spent a year with us in Princeton in 2000, 2001. And I also got to see him in action as a great colleague, as a great father, and as a great friend. Um, now, one thing we all know about Martin, and it's interesting because this has come up a few times already today, is that he is and always has been a BS free zone. <laughs> and um, in that way, I think he's a lot like Angus. And I think that's one of the reasons they have a very close bond is because they share that. Um, Angus comes from a Scots Presbyterian background, which I can only describe as as really the motto being spring is here and soon it will be winter. Right? <laughs> and I mean, some people find Angus and Martin um, would describe them as being a uh, doer, but I don't think that's accurate at all. I think that um, Martin um, has a commitment to live in the real world. And he's always modeled the kind of good behavior in hard situations that I would like to emulate and that I've always learned so much from. So uh, I 
I've brought you a little something from Princeton, from me and Angus, um, which so <coughs> we brought you a little bit of Princeton and you would like so much to us. <laughs> I reserve the right to reply. I say, I, I mean, I'm actually owed a uh, big debt to Anne, uh, and I'm sure she'll deny it. But actually, those chats on the way to Bern Kopf were very important for me because Anne was the first economist that I could kind of relate to. I mean, in the sense that actually, I, you know, this, had come from outside economics. So, uh, those of you that don't know that, I had done no economics until it's hired me to teach econometrics and economics. Um, and the kind of issues that I was interested in were not mainstream economics issues, kind of like, and to find like, you know, a top US prof who was actually interested in the same thing that I was interested in was mind blowing, you know? And then she invited me to the US to spend uh, well, probably one of the best years of my life in sabbatical there and kept up that relationship. That was actually, it really was life changing. So I owe a lot to Anne and of course to Angus. But yeah, Anne uh, was the person who kind of like, yeah, blew my mind back in the late 90s. And of course, I was terrified too. Like, <laughs> was like on the edge of Soweto, and it was actually not a good area. Kind of like, so every morning, I'm not very religious, but I pray, please, God, let me not be responsible for the death of the most important economists. And at night, uh, uh, on the way to field work uh, in Soweto. Uh, but yeah, no, we actually got through that, that time. Thanks, Anne. Uh, let's hear from from over. Uh, I kind of felt like I dropped off the radar a little bit. Uh, yeah. been... Just have to turn the camera. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I uh, was last at UCT in 2012, so, and uh, dropped off the academia radar uh, since then. So I feel like I have to reintroduce myself. <laughs> uh, I'm Obed Pimidzai. I used to be a uh, Martin student. Uh, he, he supervised me and I uh, graduated in 2010. Um, we sat in some of his econometric classes. Uh, Nicola was, uh, one of uh, my fellow sufferers <laughs> <laughs> during that time, we shared some classes with Jesse too, I think, uh, I remember. I, I don't want to emphasize the things that people have already said about the good foundation that uh, Martin set for us through his uh, uh, teaching and also the practical ways in which he did so, uh, which he, for someone who went to uh, the line of work that I do, um, Andrew, I'm from the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> I will let my colleagues know that <laughs> you think what they're reporting is wrong. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be able to work with you on that. Um, but I mean, the foundation that he set, the practical way in which he actually taught, uh, proved to be super helpful. Uh, and I haven't seen any like that, especially in the many other people that I got to, to interact with. But I wanted to say what helped me most about Martin are the things that we liked him least for. Uh, we actually hated that from him, uh, which was, uh, he was a trick examiner. Uh, uh, that that gave me my fail, my first failed test uh, <laughs> during the co coursework. But why do I say that is important? Uh, because um, he did not emphasize the rote learning. Rarely were these tests just about you repeating a formula, you know. You actually had to know, identify the problem, right? What is this about? So you actually get to internalize, know what you are learning and to, uh, be able to use that, to apply that, to actually solve real problems. So, of course, uh, most, most of us stumbled through these tests. 
Um, I have got an anecdote I would like to share. I remember there was this uh, time, there was a problem and uh, uh, uncharacteristic of Martin, there was a slight issue with that, uh, with that problem. Most people couldn't believe it. Uh, we went through half, uh, half the duration of the test until somebody raised his hand and was like, I think there's a problem here. Martin looks at it as like, how come nobody said that? Of course there's a problem. <laughs> of course there is a problem. <laughs> so later on I spoke to him like, yeah, I thought there was a problem, but you know, you're a trick examiner. So I thought maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> but I mean, the the, raise, the point, the, why I'm raising that is because um, it's emphasizing how you actually have to be confident in what you know and what you do. If you think there is an issue, you could actually uh, uh, talk about it and see, you might turn out to be right, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so as tough as why you seem to be like, but actually if you went and spoke to him and you thought, oh, I've identified something, you could actually talk about it and you could learn from that process as well. So I found that to be uh, super useful, but mostly the fact that he, um, as hard as this testing was, tricky as it was, it actually taught you to think outside the box, right? You, you do not have to just be uh, confronted with just your know, the familiar issues, the familiar questions of the time. You should you you were to, we were taught to be prepared, you know, to use your knowledge to apply to solve a problem when you see it, based on what you have learned. So that has been quite useful for me. Uh, I think he said it right at the beginning, uh, no BS. So that, go, that goes to the second, uh, uh, I think most important attribute that uh, was so useful for me. Uh, that Martin does not pull any punches, yet to learn to take very candid feedback. Uh, <laughs> So why was this important? Uh, I'll say, like, I remember uh, when I approached Martin to say, I, I would like you to be my, my thesis advisor. I said, yes. I thought I had a fantastic proposal. I went to him and he says, nah, that's not good. Uh, I gave it another try. He says, mm -mm, this is not good. <laughs> then I was like running out of ideas. I, I eventually just went with just, I think it was, Maybe my first my first attempt was maybe six or seven pages. My second attempt maybe four or so. Then I ended up going with probably one or two pages. And it says, "Huh, you've got something here." <laughs> Why was that important? It's because it taught me how to actually take candid feedback in the sense that when people are saying this is not good, probably they mean it. Because when I eventually came up with something that he thought it was good, he said, this is good, right? So from there on, I learned to say, yeah, when people say this is not good, please listen. You may not like it when they are telling you that this is not good, but maybe you need to reconsider. So this actually was so useful for me because the first person I worked for in the World Bank was one of the toughest there's ever been. To the point that whenever, like, first joined the World Bank, uh, within my first uh, my first day in the job, I went. My manager, the manager at the time, says, "If this person gives you problems, tell me." And every time uh, people were asking me, "Who do you work for?" Then I would tell the name. They're like, "Oh my God!" Mm -hmm. Why? Because that was a person who did not pull any punches and did not tolerate any force. But because of uh, the benefit of having worked with Martin receiving very candid feedback, I managed, uh, uh, we worked so well together. I'm probably there are two of us that have got, uh, uh, that developed a positive working relationship with that person. And uh, the mere fact that I could work with, uh, with that person opened many doors for me uh, because people said there must be something there to be able to work with this person. Mm -hmm. But it all came down to having gone through the experience of taking candid feedback. Mm -hmm. So for that, I'd like to thank you very much because that has been the most impactful things that has ever, have ever happened to me in my career. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, um, just 
Uh, we've got a request from two people online, Greg Lewis uh, uh, and 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 Murray Lebrant, uh to want to say something. Uh, Riza, can we? Can you want to speak first? Because you you did you were up. Okay, and then we'll take those two online. Uh, so it's Riza, Catherine, Greg, Murray, and then we'll we'll go for coffee. And those of you who still want to say something, we could maybe hold it for the. Um, the cocktail hour. Okay, thanks, Riza. Thanks. Um, thanks, colleagues. And so my, I'll introduce myself with those online. I'm Riza Daniels. I am one of uh, Martin's PhD students. Um, he was my advisor, but I'm now director of the School of Economics. And what I'd like to talk about is a little bit about how I learned. I learned from Martin in all the ways that you all did um, and was humbled by it. But what I'd like to speak about is what my understanding is of Martin's contribution to the institutional culture of the University of Cape Town and the Faculty of Commerce. Um, because Martin's also played a role in the Doctoral Degrees Board and on the Committee of Assessors. And very few people get to understand what um, that particular set of institutions do. But it basically means that if you participate there, you're looking at the examiner reports of PhD students across the faculty. Um, and so that includes the business school, it includes information systems, it includes all the other commerce departments. I was first introduced to um, being on this uh, committee in 2018 when I took over uh, the graduate convener role um, and reported to Lawrence Edwards, who was the HOD at the time. Um, and, and and I must admit it was, I was a little at sea to begin with because you feel like you're dealing with an extremely important institution that you don't really know how to apply your mind in a way um, that is fair and equitable, uh, given all of what the institution is trying to do, right? So as a university, you're trying to educate, uh, but you also have to quality control. And at the PhD level, this is a particularly important role. Um, I was extremely lucky to be able to work closely with Martin as a colleague under those circumstances and see the way in which he also pulled no punches with respect to the reports, not only the reports that were coming in from examiners, but the way in which the supervisors had sometimes incorrectly advised their students and what the consequences of those um, of those kinds of actions could be. Um, and that's, of course, a very delicate process. It's a process that politically um, is volatile. Uh, and it also is something that requires uh, a lot of tact. Now, tact is something indeed that uh, some people might question when it comes to Martin's way of engaging with them. But in my experience, uh, in this particular forum, it was just absolutely essential to have Martin there, because it kept a level of consistency in how we applied principles of dissenting examiners, of reconciling those, of actually calling supervisors in to ask them sort of what was your thinking here to actually engage constructively. Because in many ways, you, you, you are protecting the student in some ways from unfair examiners. And at the same time, you have to also question where are potential uh, limits coming in with respect to advice that was received, et cetera. So it can be a, a very complex role. When I've reflected on, on how I've learned from that um, and what does that mean for the institution, I guess the important thing is for me around that is the, the principle of ethics. We've, we live in a country where ethics in our institutions are often undermined, right? And, and we've seen it repeatedly in one forum after the next. Um, I wear a Springbok jersey today, and that's for obvious reasons. But within our sporting codes, within our universities, within our governments, within our private sector companies, we've seen stories of corruption. We've seen stories of ethics being undermined and very frequently um, being swept under the rug. So what I'd like to thank Martin for is showing me how when we start engaging in the sometimes very politically complex environments that we, and that as many of these students who have now moved into important institutions do, that we can take those principles of ethics that Martin embedded us, not just through our scholarly work, but through his actions in the institutions he's been part of, including Data First, including in this instance, the faculty, the doctoral degrees board and elsewhere. And we can also right, stand there 
and apply our minds in the best possible way, but know that we can take the criticism, we can take the fire that comes because he's, pass, he's, he's partly paved the way in that regard and showed us that you have to stand strong uh, even when you're pushed in ways that you don't want to be pushed. So Martin, thank you for that. Now we'll hear from you. I don't know, in a okay. Okay. I have a minute and I have a structure. Firstly, Martin is a good human. I know we've acknowledged that. But God, Martin also has a sense of humor, which fortunately some of us could appreciate. Otherwise, our classes would have been very dry. And while we've made Martin out to be a perfectionist, I found him quite the pragmatist and quite the realist. So the three values I took from Martin, not that he was sort of explicitly giving them to you. I remember us having an odd conversation about how he was advising me and I was his acolyte and his role was to light a candle and I would somehow, I don't know, evolve. Um, I still call him my PhD advisor and I quit my PhD twice. It wasn't his fault. Um, I first failed the class because my mother was dying of cancer. She survived. I got 48%. I did the course the next year. I learned from being in Martin's class because there was an accepting environment where I could recognize it wasn't personal failure. And even if it was, there was a chance to do better the next time. But to bring it back to the real day, I work for organizational research in the city of Cape Town. I'm not supposed to own that. I'm not supposed to be here. But basically, what we have in this instance is not problems and solutions. We have opportunities and suggestions. Now, please don't quote me on this, but I joined local government because there were more racists in the pharmacy queue because, I don't know, white people need water and black people use it. And I was like, if the politics and the economics don't work, we have more racism. So now is the time for local government. I'm currently sitting in an environment where we're learning about unelectrified customers because, of course, we have all these names for people. The government does what's where very well. If you need that data, reach out. Who's there? Not great at that. And I think Martin really played an amazing role in the humanity, in connecting the people to the data, and trying to do something that was substantive in changing it. So the principles I've taken from Martin are being unbiased. And I can tell you, as a geography joke, I've seen more maps now because we know where things are, but they can obscure as many things as they highlight. So I still like the table and the words, and then I format it with chat GPT saying, put this in an instructive but collaborative tone, because otherwise there are too many bullet points because we function on that in government. And that's terse, and it lacks humanity. So I never found Martin terse. I found him very humane. We always had honest encounters. And I don't think I was scared of him, but he may have been scared of me. <laughs> um, that's it. I, I think that the pragmatism, the fairness, and, and the care that he's shown, and the care that I think we can all share with him, can live on through all the people and all the work we do. And I think each of us has a pull. Let's take that with us. And thank you, Martin. Okay, thanks so much, Catherine. Um, uh, Greg, do you want to go first, and then uh, Murray, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll break. All right, thanks. You can unmute yourself uh, at when you do feel ready. Cool. Hopefully, you can hear me, everybody. Um, yeah, I I, I just uh, I'm so psyched to be here. This is it's just such a nice event to hear uh, people say great things about Martin because he deserves all of them. Um, um, but I was gonna say a few things quickly. Uh, I'll try to do the minute format. Um, I guess one is, uh, you know, Martin is a great teacher. I I came from a um, very much a theoryish kind of background. So actually, I wasn't as intimidated by the math when I took Martin's classes. But my God, it was great to see actual data and start to make connections between theory and practice and discovering that data was unreliable and untrustworthy and sometimes was made untrustworthy because he was a tricky teacher. Um, but it was it was really uh, a, a remarkable exposure to to practical data usage which then I think uh, became something I was interested in throughout my career. So that was one thing. Um, the other thing was to see the level of investment he made in students. I certainly was a beneficiary of that investment. And uh, I think that sort of was inspirational as well to how I think about relating to people in, in life and, and you know, really, really wanting to make the time for people where, where I can. Um, and then I guess the last thing I wanted to say is I just thought 
Martin was incredibly playful. And I, I always remember this twinkly eyedness of him, which I'm sure you, you all can see still now. But uh, I, it's just it's just uh, I think that 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 sort of spirit was was sort of um, uh, different. And uh, I mean, maybe it relates a little bit back to what Anne was saying about there being many smart and clever people in the world. But not everybody is twinkly eyed. Not everybody is playful. Not everybody really feels very genuine. And I, I value that tremendously. So uh, thank you very much, Martin. Murray, do you want to take the floor? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's it's uh, fantastic to be part of the uh, your meeting today. Uh, I'm very sorry I can't be there in person with uh, with all of our friends uh, celebrating Martin. Um, I'm just going to uh, chip in a a, a few uh, comments that. Uh, um, First, first, a few people. The last few people have all said, "Okay, you know, Martin does have a sense of humour," uh, and I think this is a this is a crucial part of the uh, Martin package, uh, and uh, even his his paper titles uh, reflect that. It's 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 a it's a, it's a dry sense of humour, and it sneaks in amidst, amidst his technical work, which makes it uh, even funnier. But uh, but disguises it quite well. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, uh, he, going way back, you know, maybe uh, you you know, uh, soon after Martin came to to UCT, um, he uh, he published a paper in the SAJE called something like uh, the mystery of the missing ghost workers, something like that. But basically, it was an Andrew uh, Carr-style uh, treatment of the fact that the, the 1996 census lost 300,000 manufacturing workers. And could we actually do, could we, could we nail this point that they were lost? Um, and uh, by triangulating data including firm data and the uh, and manufacturing census, et cetera. Anyway, uh, and uh, the type of work that Martin does and, you know, that was well represented in Andrew's uh, presentation uh, a little earlier, um, there is a lot of sleuthing about this work. Uh, but not, not many of us can actually bring that across, you know, th that th the importance of the pursuit but uh, you, you know the creativity necessary in this pursuit, and I, I guess the the one point I, I wanted to add to what everybody else has said is to um, to to give credit to Martin as what is the unique package that I that I think uh, has has really uh, added hugely to myself. Other than Martin as a person and a friend. You know, as an academic, he, he's actually an incredibly creative uh, social scientist that he weaves together with his his um, his technical mastery, and it's a sort of a unique combination um, that uh, <clears throat> that that really does uh, does make for an awesome contribution to the profession, but also has made Martin a wonderful colleague. Um, and sets him apart from just about everybody else uh, I've uh, ever known. Um, and uh, let me just bring in an area of work that I think is underrepresented today uh, a little bit, and that's Martin's work on on proxy variables and asset indices, and uh, uh, where he's made profound contributions actually uh, to 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 the profession. But the basis of the contribution is Martin sitting and thinking about, okay, but the, we're trying to measure some sort of social process here, or we're trying to measure the way we model some sort of social process. So like the fact that he's got the technical mastery is wonderful, but the fact that he then says, okay, but let's start with what are we trying to do here in terms of the society we're trying to analyze? And that's the social science and the technical coming together. 
So in his, in his RES paper about uh, proxy variables, it, it's quite a dry paper, but he was op opening up a key area that was that was really about you know sometimes we include a variable in a model of a social process that's supposed to capture all sorts of complicated things and can it do that and can it do that well and why is that better unless it's truly unobservable the components of it that are truly unobservable why would we combine it into an index rather than letting the components speak for themselves and it's a pretty you know um Pretty obvious point, and actually, it's quite a simple paper, but it's such a uh, such a telling point and contribution. And in that paper, he applies it to to parents' income and children's reading scores, and so he immediately says, "Okay, this is not just you know some sort of minor wrinkle in the in the literature on asset proxies." Uh, he then also he developed that uh, in a Solru paper on the body mass index. And he calls the paper, The Weight of Success. Um, and uh, so, um, and he's really talking about, okay, the fact that the body mass, as as we all know, it, you know, it, uh, we, we've got this problem with the body, with, with, with weight in a sense that, uh, you know, it, uh, th those at the, those at the bottom, can consume bad things and they can be overweight. But and those at the top have got too much income, so they buy too much food and consume it, and they can be overweight. And so when we use the body mass index in a, either either explain it, given that nonlinearity, or use it as a variable on the right hand side, well, what are we doing? And he brought uh, his his discussion of the proxy variables to bear. In a very insightful way, um, and so so the fact that that's buried in some solitary working paper also reveals another trait about Martin uh, that his his real contribution his his whole contribution is really not reflected in his in his published work in the journals. Um, one of one of his great traits is his propensity to ingeniously open up areas. And then leave them on the floor uh, or the drawer, depending on how you look at it, for years or even decades. Um, uh, and uh, and I, I don't know. Maybe Martin should speculate this evening when you're having your wine about how many unfinished projects he has. Uh, I'd be fascinated to know. But they're all good ones. That's the problem. That's the problem, right? Um, anyway, he eventually did come back to this theme. Of uh, around the pro uh, the assets, the proxy variables in a very in a very excellent paper about um, asset indices and measuring well-being using asset indices, which is very common practice in the in the DHS data around the, the around the world. Um, and so I'm I'm a co-author on the paper, but in Wittenbergian style, uh, we need a bit of Wittenberg analysis to work that out. So Martin's the first author. Which reflects the fact that he was the um, he was the primary author of the paper. That's not nearly adequate to describe the situation. To to give Martin some credit, one needs a size dimension to this thing, not just an ordering. If you're going to have a decent variable that measures what you're trying to measure, well, Martin's name should be in twenty five point font and mine in three point font. Um, so. Uh, but but still, and that's that is also part of collaborating with Martin. He gives uh, immensely and uh, and wonderfully, um, and he's generous. Um, anyway, there are two contributions in this paper uh, about you, the use of asset indices. The one is is about the use of asset indices to measure inequality, and and we consolidate a a, a contribution that's just to show that. When people flippantly use the asset ind index because it has negative values and it has positive values. So if you're not careful about what you're doing when you're measuring inequality, when you accumulate, you get the wrong answer. So there's many papers published out there, including in South Africa, that get the wrong answer about asset inequality. Uh, but but there's a more subtle literature coming from the health economic side that that used a sort of an additive shifter to move. 
uh, to move the shift it enough to, so that there's no negative values in the distribution. And then they calculate the Gini coefficient. And in, in the paper, Martin points out very clearly uh, that, of course, we all know that you change the distribution if you add an additive shifter. If you it's a multiplicative shifter, then the inequality measures are fine. But if it's additive, you're changing the proportions. And so, as per David Lamb's slide early on, you're changing the basis of inequality measurement. Um, and so that's a profound, much more profound contribution in this paper um, to the measurement of asset inequality. But then he ends off the paper by making a, a contribution about the index itself, because in, in the literature, this index is used on the right-hand side of an equation because we don't have expenditure or income data. So it's generally used as a measure of socioeconomic status uh, on the right-hand side of many millions of uh, regression equations using DHS data. Um, and, and amidst some very careful work, the point comes across that in almost all of these asset indices that try and work out the ownership of assets, where does that position you in the distribution? Well, if you own cattle, you're rural areas and you tend to be poorer. And therefore, in many of these asset indices, the value of the cattle is negative because it weights you down to the bottom of the distribution in a normalized distribution. Um, and so amidst all sorts, Martin's more or less dry exercise to show, look, this, the, the, the fact that, that this is valued negatively and, uh, and undervalued in a sense uh, in, in, uh, in, in all of these asset indices is consequential. He shows it's consequential. But amidst all of this, there's a very dry sort of central point that he's making. And the point is this, you're trying to measure well-being, an index of well-being. What, you, what you're implying with a negative value in the principal component or, or, or whatever on, the, on cattle is if you, if you shot the cattle, you would be better off. And is that really right? It does that make any sense? You know, that's just silly. And... Uh, uh, and that's that's Martin to a T. It's a super clever paper. At the end of the day, there's just uh, uh, this this uh, this brilliant point. And um, and again, it's the social science and the social reality. What are you trying to explain? And I think Martin's made profound contributions to our analysis of uh, uh, well-being and development in in our country, but also to the international enterprise. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Murray. Uh, we have cut one.